common injuries of the lower extremity is uh, ankle injuries, be they fractures or you know, just sprains, strains, whatever. So um, a lot of our uh, ER patients are going to have ankle injuries, and uh, ankle injuries have a tendency to be repeat injuries. You twist your ankle once bad enough, and you'll have injuries over and over and over again at the same ankle. So um, our usual projections are AP and lateral for trauma, but most of your hospitals also throw in a, an oblique, and the oblique uh, may be specified, or if uh, a, a doctor specifically asks for something, um, the, the oblique could be one of two. Either 45 degree rotation, which is most common, or um, a uh, shallow oblique, just to demonstrate the, the mortise joint. Stress views are sometimes used to determine the extent of injury to um, ligaments and tendons. And the stress is, is important to understand that the, the stress, and I'll explain how it's applied here in a bit, but it, it should be applied um, preferably by the physician, um, never by you, possibly by the patient. Okay, depending on what the, the patient's ability to cooperate is. <laughs> so, AP and lateral, absolutely necessary. Oblique, maybe one of two. Uh, stress views are, are usually um, in a doctor's office, and your whole role in this, the stress view is just to, to take the image. So, a lot of this is going to seem similar uh, to the foot. The difference here is what we're going to do is extend the knee. Um, so that the, the foot is going to be pointing straight up in the sky. Uh, so extend the leg, ankle is going to be centered to the image receptor of the ankle. You got a dorsiflex to put the ankle at a, a right angle to the leg, if at all possible. Again, if the patient can't do that because they got a, a fracture or whatever, you're not going to force them to do it, but uh, try to encourage the patient to dorsiflex the foot if they can. If they can't, then that's okay. Central race is going to be perpendicular to the ankle joint, right between the malleal line. So look for the knots. Um, if you can't see the knots because it's swollen, then just kind of estimate where the knots would be um, and put your central ray right there. Most of your ankle fractures are going to be to the distal tib fib, just like most of your wrist fractures weren't to the wrist bones themselves, but rather to the uh, radius and the ulna. Uh, most of your ankle fractures are going to be to the distal tibia and fibula. And we'll talk about some different fractures there. So you want to make sure that you include plenty of the tib fib in order to, to make those diagnoses easy. All right, so in your ankle fractures, what you're going to have in most cases is a fracture of one or both of the malleoli. Um, and really on the, the, the fibular side, what you may has, have is a, a fracture a little bit proximal to the malleolus, and you may have what, what they call a bimalleolar fracture. So it's two malleoli. So um, it, it may be that you've broken just off the medial malleolus, and you've got a fracture above the lateral malleolus. Okay. The danger in ankle fractures is not really the, the um, not I won't say the danger, but the instability is in that not only do you have the broken bones, but what you've got is you've got kind of like a compression sock. And I think we talked about this like on the first week uh, when we were going through anatomy, is you've got kind of like a compression sock that goes all the way down and holds these two bones together. And what that, that's called is a syndesmosis, and it's not unique to the tip fib. You've got that going up and down your spine as well. Okay, so the syndesmosis is kind of like a, you know, just a, a wrap that holds these two together. The problem is that in an ankle fracture, what, you, what you've got is broken bone, but you may also have a di disruption of that syndesmosis, so the compression sock rips. And a compression sock type thing keeps the, the ankle secure. You know, just if, if you just had those ankle bones themselves, you know, you'd pop out a socket all the time. That syndesmosis, the purpose for that syndesmosis is to keep everything tight, really tight, so that, you know, things don't pop in and out. So if you've got a fracture and it disrupts the syndesmosis, they have to re, uh, re-establish it. So a lot of your ankle fractures, anybody been to surgery and see a repair of the ankle fracture? 
anybody had a patient who had plates of screws in the ankles? I saw a tibia done with uh, screws in the ankle. In the ankle, yeah. And what they'll do in a lot of cases is they'll take, you know, because that medial malleolus will just snap off, and what they'll do is they'll take a screw or maybe two, and they'll run up into uh, the bone. So they may use, uh, you know, you've got two different types of screws. You got cortical screws, which goes out to the cortex, and then you've got what they call cancellous screws, which just go into the uh, into the medullary <coughs> cavity. Now, the difference between those, you've seen screws. A sheet metal screw is a screw that has little bitty fine threads, right? And they look kind of like a bolt, you know? Your bolts have nice little fine threads and you put a nut on them, right? And what they'll do is um, if, if they've got a, a fracture, let's say they're never gonna do this, but if they had a fracture of mid shaft and they wanted to put a bone that went all the way across from one side of the bone to the other, what they'll do is they'll drill a hole and then they'll uh, take this little device and they'll put threads in the bone itself. And they'll take one of those cort cortical screws because it goes to the cortex of the bone and they'll run it all the way across. But the, the other type of screw that goes into the cancellous bone looks like a wood screw. And they've got great big wide threads on those, okay? So usually a cancellous screw and they'll put a one or two going up into the bone and it won't go all the way through the, to the cortex. But if they got a bimalleolar fracture where they've got a fracture of the tip fib as well, what they'll do is they'll put a plate or the, the fibula, they'll put a plate on the fibular side and they'll put screws going in, all the way through the bone. Again, um, uh, cortical screws. But one screw, what they'll do is they'll go all the way across from the tibia all the way to, to the medial side of the fibula and reestablish the syndesmosis. Okay? The most unstable fractures of the ankle that I've ever seen have been what they call Massino fractures. Massino fracture is French spelling, so there's all kinds of weird characters in there that don't make sense to us. Uh, but what they are is it's clinically a fracture of the ankle, but there are no broken bones of the ankle. And what happens is that you've got severe enough trauma that it takes that entire syndesmosis all of that stuff in between here rips from the ankle all the way up to the knee. In a lot of cases, what you'll have is a fracture. The only fracture that you're gonna have is on the proximal end of the fibula. So it just goes whoosh, snap right there. So these fractures are so unstable that you walk into the patient's room, you know, most of your ankle fractures, you walk into the patient's room, you, you ask the patient to pick up their, their ankle, and you might get a little bit of, uh, what would be plantar flexion, right? So they're sitting on the table like this and you know, you tell them to pick it up and it, it just kind of plantar flexes all by itself, right? With a mass no fracture, you pick it up and you can see it dislocate. You might hear it dislocate. It just goes kafunk. Yeah, and it's, it's awful. And you know, you tell the patient to put their foot back down and it immediately snaps back into place. <laughs> So if you ever have one of those fractures, you know, if you, you ever walk into a patient's room and you tell them to pick their foot up and put their leg up and their leg comes up and their foot stays on the table, what I recommend you do is just go ahead and take your image receptor, 14 by 17 image receptor, and just go ahead and shoot AP of the leg. You're gonna be coming back in to do it anyway. 100% um, of the time that I've seen that happen, every single time there's a mass no fracture. No fracture here, fracture up there, okay? So if it dislocates as soon as they pick it up, immediately dislocates, save money is, that's where the fracture is, okay? Um, so, AP of the ankle, dorsiflex foot, if a patient can, um, to a right angle, and you know, shoot mid malleolus. Lateral, Again, uh, you can put the, and there's actually a, a good practical means or reason for maybe doing your lateral with medial side down on, a, on an ankle. And that is that in a lot of cases, uh, in my history anyway, I've, I've got bad ankles. And uh, most of the time, whenever I, I twist my ankle, most of my swelling is on the lateral side. So if I put my lateral side down and my swelling is here, 
I'm naturally going to be a little bit rotated. That's number one. Number two is that because of the swelling and the pain, I put it down and it's, it's a weird sensation. It's almost like it tickles and hurts at the same time, you know? So I have a tendency to put it down and jerk and it takes me a minute to come to a full landing on it, you know? Whereas if I put it on this with the, the medial side down, it, I wouldn't have a problem, okay? So if you have a patient in the, that obviously got some, some big swelling on the lateral side, you might consider putting the medial side down. But the positioning is, is identical for a more consistent lateral, put the medial side down. Most of the time you're gonna put the lateral side down. Dorsiflex the foot if at all possible, if the patient can, to, to a 90 degree angle to keep from you know, rotating the foot. Okay. So again, the positioning for an ankle and a heel and the, the foot are all, all identical. The only difference is central relocation and collimation. One inch uh, on all sides of the ankle. Make sure you get eight inches lengthwise. Make sure you include the heel. Fifth metatarsal base because that, that Jones fracture, sometimes you'll snap that, uh, that little tubercle off. And uh, anyway, that's it. So obliques, we've got two different obliques. We've got a 45 degree oblique, which is most common. Um, one thing I, I failed to point out on the, the AP and the oblique both, uh, part of the reason we want a dorsiflex is because if the patient is in plantar flexion and you shoot into the joint space, what you might do is project a heel into the joint space. Okay, so even if the patient can't dorsiflex all the way to 90 degrees, you want to dorsiflex enough for that not to happen, right? So uh, dorsiflexion of the foot, and what I recommend that you do is that because all three uh, projections ask for you to dorsiflex the foot, just have the patient, you know, educate your patient ahead of time. Because if you shoot the, the image and tell the patient you can relax and you're in dorsiflexion, what do you suppose the patient's going to do? Right? And now you got to do the lateral and you got to tell them, pull your toes back. Now you got to do the oblique and you got to tell them, pull your toes back. Right? Just educate them up front and say, I want you to pull your toes back and, you know, we're going to shoot three different views. I want you to keep your toes pulled back. Okay? And then what I recommend you do, even though we didn't go in this order, go ahead and shoot your AP, shoot your oblique, and then shoot your lateral. Okay? It's a little bit more of a, you know, if, if you shoot the lateral, you gotta get the patient up on their side, and then you gotta get them back on their back and then internally rotate. So it's economy of motion, logistics, shoot AP, internal oblique, and lateral. Okay. So the 45 degree oblique, what we're gonna see is when we oblique 45 degrees, thinking about the uh, you know the drawing that we saw before, the distal portion of the of the uh, fibula is tucked right inside the distal portion of the tibia. Okay, so we, in a, it's tough to demonstrate here because this is not human anatomy, uh, but on a 45 degree oblique, what we should be able to see is a separation so that we can see the distal portion of the fibula without superimposition of the tibia. Okay, 45 degree oblique shows us that. Now the 15 degree oblique, which is our mortise view, is gonna show us the joint space all the way around the talus, which is our mortise joint. You're not gonna see both of them on um, you know, either view. So if what your area of interest is, is to see the distal portion of the, the fibula, your view is 45 degree oblique. If what you wanna see is the mortise, which is just all the way around the talus joint, and your obliquity is going to be 15 degrees. Okay? Mortis 15, lateral malleolus <coughs> is 45 degree. Both internal oblique. Um, and that's the only difference between them. Collimation is the same as what it was for the AP. Just make sure that, um, you know, uh, when you shoot your AP, you got a central ray right here. In a lot of cases, what happens whenever we internally rotate, the patient will move themselves off of the, out of the um, uh, central ray just a little bit, right? So just make sure that you recenter or make sure that you still got light on both sides 
if you don't have to resend it. <clears throat> so mortise joints, 15, 20 degrees. And what we're trying to do is put the intermalleolar plane, that is to put your medial and lateral malleolus equidistant from the, the image receptor. So you oblique just enough to put these to the same distance from the in, in image receptor so that a plane that runs through the malleolus, malleoli, would be parallel to the image receptor. Okay. So under stress views, if you're ever asked to do stress views, again, you don't provide the stress. The uh, radiologist or the ER doc or whoever would provide the stress. And in a lot of cases, what they're gonna do is, is just take the patient's foot and what they're trying to assess is the integrity of the joint space. So they're, they're gonna grab the patient's foot and they're going to just give it a little bit of stress and they're gonna measure, may just, observe how the, the distance between the distal portion of the tibia and the, the <coughs> talus uh, compare. Sometimes it'll be bilateral. So I want to take a look at both sides just to see if the patient's anatomy is the same on both sides. Okay, so common fractures. We've got the Jones fracture. That's one I was talking about. In a lot of cases, that's not due to foot injury, but rather to ankle injury. So it's a kind of an avulsion fracture. And sometimes it's a uh, kind of an incidental finding. And if you don't have your central ray opened up enough to, to demonstrate, you know, the, the metatarsals, you'll miss that in a lot of cases. So make sure you have it open enough. Also got uh, stress fra fractures and other fractures in that area. That would be an accessory um, sesamoid bone here. Again, I, th I think they're called os tricatral uh, bones, uh, the backside of the, the ankle. So uh, sometimes it's referred to as a not stand fracture, and that's uh, the broken fifth toe. You get up in the middle of the night, you kick a door frame, or you kick something on the way to the bathroom, and that's what you wind up with is that right there. So uh, toe fractures, sometimes a little bit tough to, to actually see the fracture line, but that's pretty obviously fractured. You know, your toe shouldn't be making a, a strange left-hand turn there. Uh, sesamoid fractures, uh, can you kind of see, uh, you got two sesamoid bones here, can you kind of see one here and another one here? Can you see that? Okay, so what we've got is a, a fracture across there, and in a lot of cases, what they'll what they'll have to do is go in and remove some of those, you know, one of those two fragments. Because what, what not only is it painful, but in a lot of cases, that bone won't heal, and the bone will actually die, and it's going to get reabsorbed anyway. So, um, you know, they'll just go in and, and retake or take it out. Tarsal bone fracture is pretty rare. Um, the, the only bone outside of the calcaneus that I've ever seen fractured is the talus. And that was what you call a aviator's fracture. And it's named that because it's a very common fracture. Uh, you're going, coming in for crash landing, you're bracing, right? You brace and, you know, it, uh, it just essentially drives the, the tib fib directly through the, the talus and possibly through the calcaneus itself. So it's high impact frontal collision fractures where the, the tip fib doesn't break, but rather just goes right through the foot. Mm -hmm. Ugly, ugly fractures. <clears throat> Bimolecular fractures, most common, or very common fractures of the uh, lower extremity. So that's what we were describing before. You got a screw in the me medial malleolus and we got plates and screws on the fibula. 
apparently it was still pretty stable so that they didn't have to put a, a, a screw all the way across. You've also got a, uh, this is a Massino fracture. That's what I was talking about. It's, you know, I, I couldn't have spelled that for you if I wanted to. Um, but if you've, uh, you've not only got two malleoli, you've actually got four. You've got anterior and posterior malleolus as well. Uh, this is a Massino fracture where they actually had a fracture on the posterior malleolus. So you got posterior malleolus, you got anterior malleolus, uh, medial and lateral are the ones we really focus on. But you see the way it came all the way up and you've got a fracture of the, the proximal end of the, of the fibula. So common fractures. Okay, so um, AP of the ankle, notice we've got superimposition and <clears throat> lateral obviously superimposition. Um, and then our mortise joint is, that's really not a very good mortise joint. You, you've got, uh, it looks like the posterior portion of the, um, of the tibia is actually down into the joint space. So it's not the best mortise joint, but you kind of see the difference. Not, well, that's going to rotation. That's the mortise joint. You see it a little bit better. You still got a little superimposition there. But uh, here we've got separation between the the uh, distal portion of the uh, tibia and the fibula. Okay. So, any questions on ankle? A leg. <clears throat> so, uh, tip fib fractures very prone to um, compound fractures. Uh, we'll get uh, bayonet fractures, spiral fractures, and in a, in a lot of cases we'll get um, you know, protrusion to the bone itself. So anytime you've got a compound fracture, make sure that you, uh, you know, very careful not to, you know, not fully reduce the fracture, but draw the the anatomy back inside of the skin because you introduce bacteria, right? Make sure that you, any kind of long bone fracture, you support proximal and distal for fracture, pick it up, you know, support it on both ends. But your leg, you got uh, the leg, we're gonna refer to tib fib as the leg, uh, two bones. So the uh, tibia, the medial side, the bone on the medial side, the second largest bone in the body, the fibula on the outside really provides support in the joint spaces itself uh, more than anything else. Sometimes you'll see a couple of different things as really it takes you back the first time you see it. Um, but sometimes, just so you know, if a patient has a fracture of the, the mid shaft of the fibula for whatever reason, however they did that, I don't know. But if they have that and the syndesmosis is still strong, in a lot of cases, they won't even fix the fibula because if the syndesmosis is still strong, then the ankle and the knee is still, you know, still good, right? And the mid shaft of the, the fibula really doesn't do a whole lot of stuff. And as a matter of fact, whenever the patient is having like spinal fusion, one of the places that they will harvest bone is the mid shaft of the fibula. So it's rare, but once in a while, you, you may have a patient that comes in and it, it's not a fracture, it's just a big hunk of the fibula that's gone, it's missing. That's because they open it up, you know, maybe the patient has cervical fusion, and that's where they got the bone from. Most of the time it's from the hip, all right, or not the hip bone, the hip joint, but from the, uh, from the pelvis. But once in a while it's from the tibia. So <clears throat> the, the mid shaft is, I won't say it's unnecessary, uh, but it, you know, fractures there don't necessarily make a, an unstable um, lower extremity. So it's a long bone, proximal end. You've got uh, the condyles, medial and lateral condyle. Um, on a superior surface, you got what we call a tibial plateau. And the tibial plateau, that thing in between the condyles, is what we call the intercondylar eminence. And 
two come together is where the fossa on the distal portion of the femur, um, you know, where, where that goes is on the distal portion of the femur. Okay. Typical pl plateau fracture is fairly common. Um, on the anterior portion, what we've got is tibial tuberosity. So you got a little bit of superposition on the proximal end, just like what you had on the, the distal end between the uh, proximal end of the, of the tibia and the tibia. So the intercondylar eminence, sharp projections between the articular facets, and the lateral condyles has a facet on the posterior surface for articulation with the fibula. So it kind of fits into a fossil back there. <coughs> The uh, tibial tuberosity is just a, a point for attachment of muscles. And uh, in sports medicine and in pediatric patients, is a, aside for you know, trauma, you may get some avulsion of that tibial tuberosity kind of pulls out and away from the bone. Right. So we talked about the distal tip fib already. So the proximal end of the, the fibula is the, uh, the head that articulates on the lateral side with the, the tibia, as we talked about before. So you got an apex, and then again at the distal end, we've got the, the uh, lateral malleolus of the uh, fibula. And it, the lateral malleolus projects just slightly lower than the knee. The knee joint. The knee is formed primarily between the distal portion of the of the femur and the proximal portion of the, the tibia, which is your tibial plateau. So it's a hinge joint. And then your kneecap is a sesamoid bone. It's the largest sesamoid bone in the body. And it's located on the anterior surface or just anterior to the an anterior surface of the femur. The ligaments, we're not gonna really spend any time with, but just understand that they go through the joint space itself. So you've got the anterior cruciate ligament You've probably heard of somebody having anterior cruciate ligament issues. So it attaches at the tibial plateau at the intercondylar eminence and um, attaches to the anterior surface of the, the uh, femur as well. So you got an anterior cruciate, you got a posterior cruciate, and all that stuff, all that traffic goes through that joint space. It's from the posterior side. The patella. Again, it's the largest sesamoid bone in the body, and the apex is at the bottom, and the base is at the top. The um, if you have a pediatric patient, you know that they uh, the bones on a pediatric patient are unformed in a lot of cases. So, first time you ever shoot a, a toddler's hands or upper extremity or lower extremity, you'll be surprised at how few bones they actually have. Same thing with patella. You shoot their knee and there's no patella there. It's, the patella's there, but it's cartilage at that point. It's not bone yet. You don't see it. Uh, just kind of weird looking to be totally absent of a, of a patella. And then the femur is the uh, largest bone in the body. And the, on the proximal end, we've got the head, the rounded end, that big thing right there provides the ball portion of the ball and socket joint of the uh, hip, hip joint. So it articulates with the acetabulum, the acetabulum being the socket portion. Then the neck is just below the head, this area right here, common place for a fracture. Uh, not the most common place for a fracture, but it is a common place. So just looking at the, the hip bone itself, or the, the proximal portion of the, the femur, you got a greater trochanter. Greater trochanter is a big wad of bone on the outer portion of the femur. And you can feel it if you mash hard and you kind of rotate your, your leg in and out. Oh, this is awesome. This is awesome. I got actually a couple of people doing it. You know, I, I mentioned that in the first portion, and everybody's sitting there at the desk. You're finally getting comfortable, you know, being in here, but everybody sat there with their hands on their desk, wasn't about to touch their own hip, right? So. <clears throat> Anyway, it's this big wad of stuff right here. It's a greater trochanter. If you have a greater trochanter, you're gonna have a lesser, lesser trochanter, and that's that thing right there, okay? So you got the head, you got the neck, you got a greater trochanter, you got a lesser trochanter. 
most common fracture of the hip of the hip are what we call intertrochanteric fractures. So it's a fracture that runs along that intertrochanteric line. All right, so um, hip fractures, a lot of times will, will accompany upper extremity fractures, the patient falls and, and break, they might actually break their hip and that causes the fall and then they try to catch themselves. They wind up with a colleague's fracture in the, in the wrist. Um, so most common fracture of the hip, again, is gonna be intertrochanteric fracture. And what they're gonna do on those, in a lot of cases, is they have this screw, it's about the size of your pinky. And what they'll do is they'll run a big, uh, like a drill bit, up into the patient's hip, into, into the ball portion of the hip, uh, just at that angle right there. And then they'll put a plate that runs the, maybe, I don't know, six, eight inches down the, the femur, and that screw goes through the plate and it kind of locks the plate into the bone and puts screws across as well. So you got this big fat screw going up into the head of the femur with all these little screws going down the, the length of the femur. Sometimes though, you'll have a, a fracture of the neck and in a fracture of the neck, what they'll do is in a lot of cases, they'll put three to four screws up into the neck. So the, those screws are significantly smaller, but they'll put them in there in one of two orientations. Um, they'll either put them in kind of in a pyramidical shape like this, you know, they, they go in triangularly and a pyramid, you know, according to geometry is, is one of the more sturdy structures. It's hard to, you know, to break it again, if you got, if they're, they're all situated, you know, side by side going in like that, then it's less difficult to break than if, if you got purchase in the bone in kind of a pyramidical shape. If they use four, what they'll do is kind of go into a diamond shape so that you've got a double pyramid, right? So you got a base with an apex and an apex. So that's what they call a perk pinning. Uh, if you ever go to surgery and somebody says, we've got a hip nail, hip nail is a big screw with a plate. Uh, perk pinning of the hip is usually because they've got a, a neck fracture, okay? So common <laughs> fracture. So I have condyles, you got condyles. The condyles are your um, articular surfaces. So you got the uh, condyles here and here that articulate with the tibial plateau. And then you got epicondyles, and epicondyles are what you can actually feel. You reach down and feel your knee, you can feel you know, the, the big hard things on either side of your knee. What you're feeling is, is your epicondyles. So condyles are your your uh, articular surfaces. And then that fossa in between is in between the condyles, so it is an intercondylar fossa. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, basic, same, basically the same procedural guidelines, uh, artifacts getting out of the way, make sure you got the right patient, make sure you got the right exam, Take a history on the patient, compare the history to the exam. Um, get your image size right, and all that. So uh, anything comes can't come off the patient, needs to come off the patient. Ambulatory patients versus non-ambulatory patients. All that we've kind of done to death. For the most part, we're gonna be at 40 inches. Use the proper marker, use the proper radiation protection. Um, when we get into the hips and the pelvis, you know, the, the breathing instructions may come back into play, but until we get all the way up to the hip, and really not so much in the hip, uh, just ask the patient to be still. So the leg, um, understand what, what we're going to talk about is, is a patient who doesn't have a fracture. Anybody been in a trauma with a patient with a broken leg? No? You will, and what you'll see when you walk into the room is it's gonna be pretty obvious that the patient's got a broken leg. So what's gonna happen is that uh, the patient is gonna be on a backboard, most likely, may not be on a backboard, probably on a backboard, and their, uh, their leg, their knee is gonna be a little bit rotated, okay? So you sit down on the floor and you relax your legs. 
your knee is a little bit externally rotated. How's your foot? It's going to be also kind of externally rotated, right? But is it going to be laying all the way on its side? No. That's what it's going to, it's going to look like whenever you have a patient with a broken tib fib. As you walk into the room and you can see the knee is a little bit rotated, but the foot is all the way over on its side. Okay? So, when the, the textbook and when the PowerPoint says, you know, you toes pointing straight up at the sky and then, you know, humeral or the, the femoral condyles are parallel to the image receptor, that doesn't apply to a patient who you walk into the room and they've got obvious broken leg, right? Because what you're going to get in most cases, if they truly have broken uh, tip fib, is an AP of the knee with a lateral of the ankle on the same image. And then you're going to get a lateral of the ankle, no, a lateral of the knee with an AP of the ankle on the same image, right? You're not going to, you know, straighten the anatomy up. You're not going to manipulate the fracture because, again, what we've got in a lot of cases is a bayonet fracture or a spiral fracture, and you've got some major arteries run down right through your lower leg. And so you start moving around these sharp fractures, and you very well could nick one of those arteries. Now, if a patient's got a compound fracture and you nick one of those arteries, the patient's going to be spurting blood all over the place, right? So move the patient as little as possible, supporting both ends if you have to pick it up and making sure that if they do have a compound fracture that you don't draw the, the bone back inside of the skin and introduce bacteria. So take care of these things, right? And understand that if you've got a broken uh, tip fib, you're not going to get perfect APs. You're going to get an AP of one end and a lateral of the other, and that's just fine, right? Just don't hurt the patient. So again, these are walkie-talkie patients we're talking about. AP and leg. All right, so with AP and leg, uh, support the, the patient, uh, have pe the pelvis without any kind of rotation. Put the femoral condyles parallel to the image receptor. So if we've got femur, right, femur and tip fib, so put the femoral condyles parallel to the image receptor. Basically point the knee straight up. So you, you, put, you point the knee up and then you dorsiflex the foot to put it, you know, so that we don't wind up with the, the calcaneus and the ankle joint. Um, your image receptor, you may have to turn your image receptor a little bit um, and put the, the anatomy caddy corner on the image receptor. Some of your patients are going to be too tall to put that on a 17-inch image receptor, so you may have to go corner to corner, okay? Because the tip fib may be too long to put on just one image receptor, so instead of using two images, just catty corner the anatomy on the image receptor. Make sure that you've got plenty of um, light field and radiation field on the distal end to, to make sure that you include the lateral malleolus because it is, again, going to be lower than the medial malleolus. Uh, central rate of the mid shaft of the de anatomy. Okay. And it should look like that. So look at the, the sharp ends of these fractures. Uh, in this case, you know, they did get an AP and an AP, but if, if the patient presents to you with a AP knee with a foot, you know, basically out to the side. That's exactly how you're going to shoot. Uh, don't grab the foot and again pull it up and say, okay, I need this point at the sky. So lateral, rotate the patient over onto the lateral side. Again, dorsiflex the foot and just not a whole lot to say about the lateral. Um, you're going to have superimposition both AP on the proximal and distal end. Um, on the AP, you see you got superimposition here and here, and you're going to have great superimposition on a lateral. Okay, so you're not going to have uh, a clear view of the, the proximal or distal end of the, the fibula without superimposition on the tibia at all. Um, femoral condyles, since they were parallel on the AP, they're going to be perpendicular, right? So again. Uh, when we're talking about the upper extremity, I said that you can include 
you know, forearm, wrist, hand, all in a single view. Same thing applies here. Um, if you've got an ankle, you know, if the, the doctor asks for an ankle and a tib fib, you have to shoot separately an ankle and a tib fib. You can't include two, you know, two views. Two different anatomies on a single view. Okay, so lateral. Looks like we got a little bit of motion going on with this one, so it's really not the best image uh, to find its way into textbook. So knees. Knees are uh, a complicated joint as well as the ankle. So we've got a lot of different views for the knees. Most of your hospitals are just gonna do AP and lateral. Uh, some of your hospitals, and certainly some of the clinics, will do an AP weight bearing. Now when we're talking about weight bearing of either the foot, and we do weight bearing of the feet, um, or the knees, or the ankles, the patient provides the weight. Okay, you don't have to give the patient weight on top of you know, their own body weight. So in the upper extremity, when we were talking about weight bearing in the uh, AC joints, we had to give the patient something to hang on to, right? Here we don't. The patient's body weight provides the weight. In the feet, what we're looking for in a, in a weight bearing feet is uh, evaluation of longitudinal arch. See if the patient's really flat footed or if they've got fallen arches. <coughs> um, and fallen arches is just soft tissue. Uh, in the knees, most of the time when we're doing uh, weight bearing knees or ankles, they're evaluating the patient for surgery to see whether or not you know, they've, they've got any joint space there or if they need uh, their knees replaced. So they're gonna be standing. And sometimes we'll do obliques of the knees. Uh, sometimes some of your hospitals will have four view knee. Anybody, anybody at UT on 271? No, oh, okay. Do y'all do four view knee still? Uh, I haven't really seen that. Yeah, same. They used to do a four view knee. So they did AP lateral and both obliques. Uh, I don't know if they do it or not anymore. Most of the hospitals that I, I've worked in, um, if they did obliques of the knees, they only did internal rotation. So we'll, we'll take a look, if we have time, at both internal and external rotation and see uh, what uh, you know, the difference between those are. Probably get that next week. We don't have five minutes left. Yep. What would a sunset view set on? Sunrise view. Sunrise, sunrise view. Yes. That's of the patella itself. That's just of the patella. And we'll talk about that too, but again, probably not until next week. That's for broken patella. So AP of the knee. Um, again, we're going to uh, put the femoral condyles parallel with the image receptor. Uh, rotation of the pelvis really is insignificant at this point. You know, I've had patients who were unable to internally rotate their toes enough to put the femoral condyles parallel to the image receptor. So in that case, what you would do is you would rotate uh, towards the opposite hip. You know, the patient just whatever, for whatever reason, couldn't internally rotate enough. You'd rotate towards. So ro no rotation of the pelvis really doesn't play a big role here. But what you want is to fully extend the knee if the patient can and put the femoral condyles parallel with the image receptor. Now, this is the most complicated thing that we're going to talk about today in the knee is that, you know, I'm going to be a little indelicate here, but most of the time we, we gain weight, we gain weight in two places, right? Right here and right here. So if you have a hypersthenic patient, um, what that's going to do is it's going to, going to put the femur at an increased angle, you know, because you don't gain a whole lot of weight on the back of your heel. It's going to put a, a different angulation than somebody who's asthenic and doesn't have any backside, right? So, what we've got are three possible angulations for the central ray for body habitus. So, if we have a patient who's the distance between their ASIS, which is that bone that sticks out of the front of your pelvis here, to the tabletop is 19 centimeters, then what we're going to do is we're going to angle the central ray three to five degrees caught it, all right? So the patient is asthenic, they don't have a whole lot of cushion back here. So the, 
their uh, femur is fairly well par parallel. So what we're going to have to do is angle uh, three to five degrees caught at. If we have a patient who's sthenic uh, or hyposthenic, then our central ray angulation is going to be perpendicular. And if we have somebody who's hypersthenic, now we've got you know this going on, then what we're going to do is we're going to angle three to five degrees cephalat. And what we're trying to accomplish here is put, to put the central ray parallel to the tibial plateau. So if we have somebody who's asthenic, look at the orientation of the tibial plateau, right? It's kind of going like this, right? So our central ray is going to go kind of like this, right? If you have somebody who's sthenic, then our tibial plateau is vertical, so our central ray needs to be vertical. If you have somebody who's hypersthenic, then We've got an angulation like that, so we're going to use an angulation like that. So take a look at your patient, hypersthenic. We use a cephalic angulation. Most of the time, you're just going to use five degrees. If you have a patient who's asthenic, then you're going to use uh, about a five degree caudal angulation. So, how do you remember all this? Remember 19 to 24. Okay, just remember 19 to 24, and remember five, three to five degrees. So if they're below 19. Three to five caudate. Caudate. If they're above 24, cephalides. Right? Yeah, we're really out of time, huh? Well, we'll pull up there and we'll pick up with a lateral knee uh, next week. Any questions?